Cool. Got it. Uh, and I'm just triple checking. Me recording on my computer doesn't stop your recording. No, no, it? no, no. It's perfect. You can, uh, as long as you have a, a pro account, then You're you fine. can. Yeah, it's fine. I can record. You can record. You can also let a few other guys record if, you know, for backup. <laughs> but everything sure. is fine. Yes, it's, it's, I'm recording right case. now. Um, yeah. I'll start to let everybody in. So, will I? Perfect. Good evening, everyone. How are you? Take your time. If you want to settle in, we're going to get started now in just a minute or two. Gregory, Michael, Shai. What's up, guys? Gutavo. Uh, Gutavo. <laughs> Whatever you do, make sure to not pour what I just did, pour some of your putching into a water glass, <laughs> thinking that it's water. <laughs> if you saw the reaction on my face, just going, it's uh, it's because I just drank 52.5% alcohol. Neither so, we have the called Arak. It's like Uzo. Yes, I know it. Rocky. Normal spirit, yeah. Um, now, I think it has probably just as long a history as Irish whiskey, correct me if I'm wrong, but Iraq was, I think, this, well, a little bit later, I think it was around the 13th, 14th century. Irish whiskey kind of dates around, well, a lot of references go back as far as the 12th, 11th century. Um, have you tried much, Iraq? Yeah, we have a lot of it here in Israel, so we're trying it a lot. Cool, nice. Um, I know here in Dublin, for example, there's a lot of um, putching bars. So like it's starting to become a lot more popular where you can go into an establishment, go into a bar and you can order not a whiskey, but you order like and you make spirits and you like can try 10, 15 different ones, I'd say. Uh, they also only, do... only put putching? Only? Only putching. Yeah, I'll give you a name. Hang on, I'll give you a name of a bar next time you're in Dublin. Um, so this bar here, 1661. Uh, after the masterclass tonight, uh, I don't work for them and I don't sponsor them or anything like that. But yeah. um, if you want to look after the masterclass tonight or even during it, it's great putting bar. Uh, they also do putting cocktails. So they do like Negronis or Boulevardiers. They do Spirit Ford, Citrus, Long Drinks. They even have an, an Irish coffee with um, wow. putting called their Belfast coffee, which is amazing. So, so good. <laughs> Tomer, please uh, speak up so um, uh, Chris can hear you. Chris, could you please let uh, uh, Tomer also um, uh, record? Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely no speak problem. Up. Speak up, Tomer. Tomer? Tomer? Can you hear me? Michael, could you please uh, mute? Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Oh, that's great. Now I can hear you too. So this is Tomer Chris. Please let him record as well. Hey, Tomer, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Thank you. Bo, mama tzav. I don't know. We'll try. We'll wait another two more minutes, so we'll be finish, fashionably late, and then we'll start. Yeah, that's no problem at all. I meant to say, what's the weather like at the moment with you guys? I'm, I'm, I'm assuming it's a little bit warmer than Dublin at the moment. You know, it's always, always hot in here, even in in winter. <laughs> uh, and it's it's what it's nine o'clock now at the moment in the evening for you, isn't it? Yeah. Yep. Oh, that's that's definitely an appropriate drinking time. Uh, it's not a it's not five p.m. or or four p.m. or something. Um, yeah, here at the moment, it obviously you you know this as half more than anybody having lived in Ireland and in Dublin. Oh, at the moment, I'm looking out at a, a grey sky, completely cloudy. Oh, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> rain and 
uh, how much? 13 degrees. So that is summer. The perfect, for perfect um, uh, weather for drinking whiskey. Mm, absolutely. I feel like I'm getting burnt through the window. <laughs> I promise this to Asaf. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> Are you like my new glasses? I think now you'll be able to see me through the sunshine. <laughs> you know, I always tell the, tell the story. When I was in uh, Ireland, we had uh, uh, one time that we had the weather alert. And uh, uh, people were very worried all over the news, you know. Um, too hot, you know. And they mm. say it's 25 degrees Celsius. Yeah. And 25 degrees Celsius is here every day. So... <laughs> Weather alert for you, 25 degrees, and for us, it's every day. So think about this. I know, it's so crazy. And it's funny, like, I remember having this exact discussion with someone recently from Israel. They, were, they asked me the question about drinking whiskey with water or drinking with, with ice or having it with, you know, mixers or whatever. Um, it's a question you, you guys know you get asked all the time. And I, I kind of took the very, I suppose, professional answer of saying, look, it's your whiskey. Drink it how you want. I don't care. Do whatever you will. But he was saying to me, you know, with 35 degrees Celsius or 40 degrees, you know, this is the reason why people drink whiskey in different ways. It's not just because of our culture. It's also because of the climate. Uh, and I think we have this notion of Ireland and Scotland that everybody drinks whiskey the same way, but they don't. Um, and, I, you know, I've been very fortunate to travel now a lot around the world and I've seen how many different ways people drink whiskey. So. I no longer say to people, you know, you have to do this, you have to do that, because at the end of the day, they'll probably do it in a different way. Um, but yeah, here it's 13 degrees. Um, good, good whiskey oh, drinking weather anyway. Wow, yes. Uh, so it's nine and six minutes, uh, six minutes after nine, so we'll probably um, uh, get started. We don't oh, have we've, lost, we've lost six minutes of drinking. Yeah, let's go, guys. Sure, we'll kick it off. But um, yeah, so good evening, gents. Thank you so much for having me. It's, it's lovely to meet you all. Um, you can probably see from my name below, but my name is Chris Hayes. So uh, what I do for Teeling Whiskey is I am the European brand ambassador for Teeling Whiskey Company. What, what my job basically entails is I represent the company across uh, all of our European markets. So typically, you know, pre-COVID, I would probably spend about 80 to 90% of my time on a plane. Whereas now I probably spend about 80 to 90% of my time on a computer. Um, on top of that, I work very closely with our sales team, our domestic sales team here in Ireland, and of course, uh, with our visitor center, our distillery based in Dublin, which is kind of nestled away in a small area. I know, Asaf, you've been to, uh, to Dublin. Have any of the rest of you guys been to the capital before? Have you been to Dublin? Uh, not yet, unfortunately. Not yet. Yeah, I know travel obviously is unfortunately not as a, as possible at the moment, but fingers crossed, you know, 2022, 2023, we can welcome the, the whole club uh, in our distillery and have a big tasting. Uh, Tomer, have you you been to our distillery? No, I haven't, uh, but uh, please would you give me... The, would you please Hello. give me the... Uh, Sorry, your, your, your audio just broke off there for a second. Could you repeat what you said? I need a permission for, rec for the record. Oh, to record. I, well, okay, hang on. I'll make you a co-host and you should be able to uh, let me know if it's not, if you, if you can't record right now. Um, but yeah, as I was saying, based in Dublin, in this small area called the Liberties, which I'll talk to you a little bit about later on. Uh, now, this evening, as you know, we have got an absolutely incredible lineup. I think it was really well chosen, and I think there's such a variety. You know, we were only just talking before uh, we started, myself and Asaf, on what particular whiskeys to choose. And uh, what really interests me was the fact that we have so many different expressions from our portfolio. Like, we're trying some of our new make, we're trying some of the newer whiskeys that have been distilled, you know, 100% in our new site in Dublin. We have some of our vintage reserve, which is coming from Cooley. And Cooley is a name you'll be familiar with by the end of this evening, if you're not familiar with them just quite yet. Uh, and of course, even some of our limited releases, uh, like our stout cask, which we're going to be starting off with. So just before we jump into everything, the one thing that I have to say is, I don't see tonight as like a lecture. So if you have any questions at any stage, 
Uh, if you have any comments, if you love the whiskey, if you hate the whiskey, please interrupt me at any point. I'll more than happily take any questions. Uh, I fully appreciate that you're all kind of big whiskey aficionados or whiskey nerds like myself. So uh, yes. please do feel free. And I mean that as a compliment. Uh, please feel free to, uh, to ask any technical questions. Uh, I'm a certified distiller myself, so I'll happily answer anything that's a little bit more, you know, less basic and more looking at the ins and outs of how teeling actually operates. Um, if you do prefer, you can also type the comments. I'm sure you're all comfortable with Zoom at this stage. We're probably all sick of it. Um, so if you want to type any comments as opposed to unmuting yourself, you can also do it that way. There's no problem doing it that way. Um, so the first whiskey we are going to be starting off with is our stout cask. Now, just before we taste this whiskey, to give you a very brief introduction into who Teeling Whiskey is. Uh, Teeling, of course, is the first new distillery in Dublin uh, in over 125 years. So nearly a century, there's been no whiskey distilled in the capital, in a country that has such a history, such a reputation for making whiskey. And um, we're very much part of this kind of new generation of whiskey producers. You know, at the moment, Irish whiskey is going through an incredibly interesting transformation where it's constantly growing, constantly getting bigger. And um, even despite a global pandemic, Irish whiskey is still one of the fastest growing spirits in the world. And how Teeling are looking to lead this next generation is by focusing 100% on the stuff here in front of you. So focusing on the liquid, on the glass, how does it actually taste? How can we innovate? How can we experiment on every single stage of the process? and really create Irish whiskey that is different. Now, what I mean by that is when we go all around the world and we talk about Irish whiskey, Irish whiskey still to this day is kind of perceived through one particular aspect, which is triple distillation. So if I ask any of you, or even if we take our basic whiskey consumer and you say, Descri describe Irish whiskey in comparison to scotch, nine times out of 10, you will hear people say, Irish whiskey is triple distilled, Scottish whiskey is double distilled. Irish whiskey is unpeated. Scottish whiskey is peated. Irish whiskey is soft, it's light, it's fruity. And these are, you know, these are okay uh, kind of general adjectives to attach to Irish whiskey. But brands like Teeling, we're looking to show that, you know what, that's very surface level. We want to show that there's actually a lot more beyond Irish whiskey, say, than just triple distillation. Now, I know for the group that, we're, that I'm talking to tonight, you understand that there's a lot more behind the whiskey process. The yeast strains you're using, the fermentation duration, uh, the types of barrels, are they seasoned, are they unseasoned? Or is it a first fill, is it a second fill, is it a third fill? What type of wood are you even using? Even the mash fill, you know, can we experiment on different raw materials to bring new flavors? And Teeling is looking at every single solitary step to bring new whiskey to consumers like yourselves. So the brand was set up in 2012, and we started distilling in February in 2015. Now, I started with Teeling Whiskey Company, fresh-faced and a lover of whiskey and spirits. I previously worked bars, uh, and I worked for other companies. I actually worked for breweries before I got involved in the whiskey industry, but I've always been kind of passionate for the two things. Uh, I actually homebrew myself, so I make my own, my own beer, my own cider, and my own uh, kind of soft drinks and stuff. Um, and I started with Teeling in 2016. So now we're obviously six years on or five years on. We've just celebrated our kind of sixth anniversary as a fully functional distillery in Dublin. So that's just a, a little bit of a information to give you an introduction to Teeling. Now, of course, I'll be talking to you a lot more about the brand later on. But to start off with a whiskey, now that we have everyone here. Uh, the first whiskey we're going to be trying is the Teeling Stout Cat. So I'm number absolutely five. delighted. And go ahead, sorry, Asaf. I think you put up your hand there for a question. No, it's, it's number five, just guys. Number uh, five. Oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so number five, I must remember, apologies, which one you're tasting. Number five is actually going to be the first whiskey. Now, there's a, a reasoning behind my madness. The reason that I wanted to start off with this first whiskey is this is actually... Alex? Mute, please. Sorry, I think if you do have a question, Alex, please let me know. But the reason I wanted to choose this first whiskey is this is actually the same base 
as our flagship whiskey. So if any of you do know Teeling before today, or even if you've never heard of us, the flagship whiskey of Teeling Whiskey Company is the one just here behind me, our small batch whiskey. So what this basically is, it's a premium blend of three parts corn and one part barley that's been distilled obviously in column and pot stills and then vatted together, blended together in American bourbon barrels and also rum casks, Central American rum. Instead of using rum casks for this particular iteration that you're trying, we have done a collaboration or cask exchange with an Irish brewery. So I'm sure you all know the Irish were, we're not too bad at making beer. You know, we've some small craft artisanal breweries in Dublin. You know, there's one particular brand starts with a G. I'm sure you may have heard it. They're, they're not too bad at making dark beer. Uh, this is not a collaboration with Guinness. This is with a, a smaller scale company called Galway Bay. They're one of my favorite breweries in Ireland. They make everything from you know, IPAs, uh, sours, uh, stouts, dark, you know, dark beers, uh, like porters, black IPAs, imperial stouts. They even have sour style beers now. So goods or lambics, they do everything. And uh, this was one of our first cask exchanges that we ever did. So we sent them some whiskey barrels. They made a beer matured in our whiskey. And they, of course, sent us back those beer barrels. We made a whiskey matured in beer. So a nice kind of exchange between the two producers and um, the stout cast that they sent us were this absolutely stunning 9.6 percent imperial stout so really heavy you know quite hot forward uh, it was actually barrel aged in our rum casks from our small batch so it kind of comes a full circle and it's why i wanted to start with this and um, the whiskey itself is 46 percent non-chill filtered and natural coloring. Now we take this for granted in 2020 or 2021, I should say, um, but back in 2015, this was something very new for Irish whiskey. Most Irish whiskey was bottled at 40%, maybe 42, maybe 43. A lot of Irish whiskey was chill filtered and a lot of Irish whiskey was matured in either port, bourbon or sherry casks. So having an imperial stout influence on Irish whiskey was something completely different back in 2016. Nowadays, and I'm sure even, you know, we were talking about milk and honey earlier, earlier. I'm sure now even in Israel, you have producers who are starting to use stout or beer barrels. So it's, it's, it's not that it's nothing new, but back in 2016, it was very, very forward thinking. So that's kind of just the story behind the whiskey. Uh, as we say in, in Ireland, and I don't know if you know the word, but it's a very important word for this evening. To say cheers is uh, slauncha. So slauncha, everybody. Enjoy the first dram, and we'll talk through it a little bit more. Thanks. But it really is, honestly, one of my favorite whiskeys from Teeling Whiskey Company. What's very cool as well is the brewery actually releases a new expression every year, roughly around Christmas time. Now, obviously, I'm sure anybody who's been to Ireland or if you've lived in Ireland, you'll know that drinking dark beer is very, very typical, particularly around winter time. Um, and they do this new release every year using our whiskey barrels. And um, this particular whiskey actually won the world's best Irish blended whiskey at the World Whiskey Awards in 2019. So it's an incredibly popular uh, release from Teeling Whiskey Company. The only sort of downside to it is unfortunately it was a quite a limited run. So you will struggle to find a lot of bottles in this in Israel, for example. There was only uh, 6,000 bottles in production mm -hmm. for this particular run. Um, but what do you think of it? Let me know in the comments or give me a shout if you want to unmute yourself. Let me know what you're tasting is the first thing that I am very interested in. It's very interesting. So I also have a question related to um, uh, beer casks, you know? Um, yeah, sure. You're, you're using uh, uh, stout casks right now, at this moment for this expression. Mm -hmm. Do you have any um, uh, intentions of using any other types of beer, you know, maybe like, uh, uh, let's say maybe uh, sour, Whiskey, sour mm. beer or IPA or something like this, I, you know, like, like Lefidich? Yeah, I like your thinking. And it's, it's yeah. funny, Asaf, I suppose not to jump the gun, but to just to give you one figure. In our warehouse at the moment, which is about an hour, an hour and 20 minutes from our distillery, we have close to now 200 different expressions. 
So anything you can think of from beer, tequila, gin, rum, cognac, fortified wines, anything. Uh, I'll, I'll dig a little bit deeper into it later on, but the short answer is yes. We have lots of different uh, beer casts that we're using. So most recently, we have experimented with some amber ale. Amber ale is a style of beer. It's the same as red ale, where typically you have amber malt. It's quite sweet, toffee, biscuits, really kind of light style beer. Uh, we've also experimented with some IPA, um, some um, peated porter. So a oh, uh, no, small this, bit this of nice. smoked grains, which was incredible. Uh, I'm trying to think what else we've tested out. Some barley wine. It's a barley wine. It's, again, a style of beer that's typically quite high ABV. It'd be around 10 to 12%. Um, and we have also tried, I'm sure there's more that I'm missing, but yeah, short answer is we've tested lots of different styles of beer. So for me personally, and again, feel free to tell me what you're tasting. The first thing that I get is a lot of those darker notes. So like dark chocolate, coffee, or roasted grain on the nose. This uh, is really barley what, wine. Oh, nice. Yes, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So yeah, barley wine, it's, there's two styles of barley wine, English and American. I don't know if yours is a, an English Israeli. style barley wine or if it's American, <laughs> but they're both very good. Yeah. But yeah, the barrel, and I'm glad you said it, Tomer, the barrel is incredibly noticeable. And this is something, this is a DNA that you'll see throughout all of Teeling Whiskey. This is really kind of the starting off point of our story. When we started off in 2016, we really wanted to push the boundaries of Irish whiskey maturation in particular. So just one stage and really see how can we test out different avenues that people have never done before. So this started with obviously first different season casks. We're now at a point where we're looking at even different styles of wood. So I don't know if you know this, I'm sure you all do. Irish whiskey doesn't have to be matured in oak wooden barrels. Whereas in Scotland, you know, it has to be matured in oak. And that could be Spanish, that could be American, that could be Portuguese, but it has to be oak. In Ireland, we can use any style of wood within reason, you know, that's practical for the maturation. So, for example, we can use uh, chestnut. Now, chestnut, it's used a lot in the wine industry, but it's not used as much in the whiskey industry. A lot of people tend to blame it for the fact that it can be quite porous. So you lose a lot through uh, angel share. But more importantly, it's quite difficult to deal with in the sense that it adds a lot of tannins, a lot of uh, gallic acids. So it's quite similar to European oak, where it's quite spice forward. But Irish whiskey can be matured in chestnuts, whereas Scotch cannot. Um, likewise, we've recently experimented with Amberana. Now, Amberana, it's a Brazilian hardwood that's typically used to make cachaça. So to make a, a style of, uh, I suppose, rum in inverted commas from Brazil. Uh, again, this is something that's not popular or not possible, I should say, in a lot of other countries. So Ireland and Israel actually have a lot of similarities in terms of our maturation laws in the sense that they're both very loose. We can kind of do sort of whatever we want within practical reasons. I know obviously the angel share is much different uh, in the sense of much hotter climate. So you have a lot more losses, um, but it's a faster, more rapid maturation. Whereas in Ireland, it's obviously slower, but we kind of tend to argue it can be more nuanced. You know, we can pinpoint flavors throughout 30, 40 years, I suppose, much easier than in a hotter climate. That's not to say it's not possible. It's just, I think, a little bit easier. And um, so the barrel definitely, yeah, really noticeable on the nose. The dark chocolate, the hops, the kind of vegetal side. Uh, this is, again, an imperial stout. So an imperial stout is where it's a higher hop content, higher ABV. Um, but on top of that, you've got these notes of, of the Teeling Whiskey blend. So blend, I think, and I'm sure some of you are thinking, oh no, we're starting with a blend. It kind of has this negative connotation. And it's something that Teeling really wanted to debunk and showcase that, you know, we can make some of the best whiskey in the world, but that also happens to be blended. And I think this is a perfect example of that. Um, so the typical, you know, whiskey, DNA notes that you'll get will be the likes of vanilla, toffee or honeysuckle, those typical dried fruits, so like caramelized apples or even possibly caramelized pears, like poached pears. And for me, there's these really interesting kind of salty, like maritime notes that you get on the nose. Now, for me personally, I still don't know if that's coming through from the casks 
or if it's coming through from another component, say from the actual spirit itself. I've, I've chatted a lot to our master distiller about this, and I still can't pinpoint where the salty, maybe it's just my own personal palate, um, but a little bit of saltiness. Finish, it's a lot of citrus. So lime skins or marmalade, just for me personally. If you're getting something different, uh, I'd love to hear it. But that's, that's essentially the, the stout cask in a nutshell. So that's just the first whiskey of the night. Now, as I said, if you do have any questions, please feel free to stop me at any point. What I'm going to do now is I'm just going to share my screen again. And uh, the next whiskey to give you a bit of a heads up that we will be trying, I have the list here, is the Brabazon 2, or Brabazon 4. So it is your sample four, number four, which actually yeah. does work out well. Yeah. Um, but just before we move on to that, again, coming back to the Teeling uh, the Teeling brand, where we first set up was with two brothers. So we are a family owned, you know, independent company uh, set up with Jack and Stephen Teeling, who set up the company in 2012. Now, Jack and Stephen, they first started in the Irish whiskey industry during the 1980s. So if any of you know anything about Irish whiskey, you'll know that at one point, Irish whiskey was incredibly prominent throughout the world, you know, represented 70% of global whiskey sales in the 18th and 19th century. By the late 19th century, it was nearly nothing. So in the 1980s, Irish whiskey only represented 2% of global whiskey sales. Uh, not only that, but all of the distilleries across the country had all shut down. Um, so if, you, if any of you had been over to Ireland, even you know, in the 1990s, before the kind of renaissance of Irish whiskey, there was very few producers that you could try. For example, I'm sure everybody either knows of or has heard Jameson, Tullamore Dew, Bushmills, and maybe Connemara. The reason that we know those whiskies is because they were the only available producers during the 1980s. Now, the Teeling family, where they kind of come into this general story, is they ran Ireland's only independent distillery during the 1980s. So in the 1980s, three distilleries, you had Middleton in the south, which of course encompassed Jameson, Redbreasts, Powers, Paddy, the Spot Range, loads of different whiskies. Um, obviously, you know, some of the most prominent whiskies around the world now today in 2021. You Bush Mills, again, a formidable force during the 1980s and even further back as one of the oldest distilleries in the world. And then you had this smaller distillery, which was run by the Teeling family called Cooley. So Cooley was this distillery that was based on the border of Northern Ireland and Ireland. So right on the cusp. Um, it was an independent run company that was run by a man called John Teeling. So John, he ran the distillery with his two sons, Jack and Stephen Teeling. Jack, he was the CEO. Stephen was head of sales and marketing. And they ran this company for years together as a family. Now, if you have ever tried Connemara, so the Turf Moor, any of the classic expressions, even the cast brand, Connemara was originally distilled and was part of the Cooley portfolio. So obviously, you know, an incredible whiskey that they had under their name. Uh, Cooley also included Kilbegan and Tyrconnell. So Kilbegan is one of the oldest Irish whiskey brands in existence. Um, and again, Tyrconnell, great whiskey. They do a lot of fortified wine maturation. Uh, they also have higher, uh, I suppose, ABV bottlings with like 43%, 46%. So they were kind of a bit ahead of their time. Um, but the long story short, Jack and Stephen, they decided to sell this distillery in 2011, just before we set up Teeling Whiskey Company. And at the same time, what they decided to do is they decided to keep about 16,000 barrels of whiskey to set up in Dublin. So they sold to Jim Beam, who were having a merger with Suntory, to become Beam Suntory and the Teeling family, they went off with a lot of whiskey. They, they left with the good stuff and they set up their, their new distillery in Dublin in 2012. So if you are wondering, what, why are we about to try a whiskey that is nearly 17 years old? The Teeling Oni is set up in 2012 as a brand and 2015 as a, as a distillery. The reason being is because we're taking from that old family reserve that was distilled in the 1980s at the Cooley Distillery. So I hope that that's clear. That's kind of the, the general story of Cooley to Teeling. The last date here, 
So as I said, 2012 is the brand, 2015 is, is the distillery. The last date, 1782, and you'll see this on a lot of our bottlings, this was the ancestors of Teeling. So the furthest that we can go back with the name, distilling in Dublin, uh, there was a man called Walter Teeling, who basically had a small craft distillery in Dublin city, actually only about 600 meters from our new site. And this was really the main reason why Jack and Stephen wanted to set up in Dublin in particular. It was obviously because Dublin was a very important uh, part of Irish whiskey history, but more importantly, because of the family ties was why they chose the Liberties and Dublin in particular. Um, now, just before moving on to coming back to the whiskey, the one that we are about to try is our Brabazon 4. So you can see there is a slightly new, now I'm, I'm holding up the third edition here, but there's a slightly new repackaging for this particular series. Um, have any of you tried our Brabazon before, or even Teeling Whiskey, just out of interest, have many of you tried the Teeling range before? I see Hila, yeah, shaking your head. Have you tried just the kind of the core range, or have you tried any of the, the limited stuff? Yeah, we tried uh, most of the whiskey that came from Teeling till yet. Yeah. <laughs> well, Danny, I know that you're a, a Teeling super fan. I, I was going to say, I, I barely noticed you there. It's great to see you. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, so you know what I'm Israel is a small country. Yeah. <laughs> we tried, I think, most of the range that we get to put our hand on. And I think I, have, I still have uh, one bottle of Makanmawa. Oh, nice. The old one. The, you mean the 22, one of the older age statements, or the, the classic? The classic. The nice. one that was sold. I will be I'm very interested. So is it, is it uh, and apologies if I'm mispronouncing anybody's name. Please do let me know. Is it, is it Menash? Am I pronouncing yeah. that correctly? Menash uh, is fine. Uh, Menash, I'll be very interested to hear what you think of our uh, Black Pits in particular when we get on to it later. This is obviously our first piece of whiskey from Dublin. Um, so if you haven't tried that yet, I'll be, I'll be curious to your, uh, to your opinion. But the Brabazon series, this was actually the second series that we ever did at Teeling. So the first series we did was called The Revival. If any of you diehard Teeling fans, you'll know what I'm talking about. Stunning whiskey, five different editions, all matured in either fortified wines, fruit-based spirits like Calvados, Pinot de Charente, Muscat. Uh, we'd one that was matured in Rome, very experimental and all slightly higher age statements. So all somewhere between 12 to 15 years old. I think, I, did I just see a bottle of it down the bottom there, Hila? Was that a revival? Nice. Yeah, so that was the <laughs> first <laughs> series. Whiskey ever, by the way. Oh, thank 15. you. That's very nice of you to Rome, say. Yeah. Which, which edition is it? The Rome, 15. The 15. Oh, mm -hmm. Honestly, I think it's one of the best of the series. That the the best the whiskey ever. <laughs> that and the two, the Calvados, for me, was just like a, a, a liquid dessert. It's so, so easy to drink. The 15 um, years old is the one uh, in the rum cask? Yeah, 15 yes. rum. Number two was uh, Calvados, I think it was a 12-year-old single malt. And then you, Pinot de Charente, Muscat. And the final one was um, Cognac and Brandy. On my first uh, meeting with Dylan, it was the single malt and then the 15 years old on mm. the same uh, exhibition. It just goes to show, like, and, lit and it's, it's a great point, Danny. Like, when I started with Teeling, literally, we had three whiskeys. We had the 21-year-olds and we had the revival one. So imagine working a whiskey show and saying to someone, yeah, here's a six-year-old blended whiskey and here's a 21-year-old single malt. And they were just like, what? Who is Teeling and what is this about? Whereas now I think we have a lot more. And you have it, yeah. That is a beautiful, beautifully well-kept bottle. Um, this is one of the best tealings I've ever drinking in my life. Same. Uh, for me, I always call it the holy grail of tea yes. whiskey. Because it's it, back in the day, and I'm conscious that we're recording, so I'll watch what I say. But back in the day, this was very cost-effective. It was about 110, 120 Ooh. euro a bottle. This um, is not what I bought it for. <laughs> Did you pay more or less? More. Okay. Now this was this was at the start. This was like when it was very first released. Um, and so you're talking what a 21 year old whiskey for 110, 120 euro. It's an amazing price. Uh, and also again lightly peated. You know, 10 percent peat with 90 percent distiller's malt. Um, this tripled in price within like the first year. 
it was just so popular. I've se- I've still seen bottles of it around Europe. So like you can find it in Belgium and France in in just kind of random cavistes and random stores quite easily. Um, Auctions. Yeah, and, and of option. course on the secondary market. Yeah, but the the twenty one year old is very important for the teeling black pits. So when we do taste this later on, remember about the twenty one because I'll tell you why. There's a reasoning how it kind of influenced this. And uh, coming back to what you said, Danny, yeah, like we started with the with the single malt and the Renaissance one, this 15-year-old single malt. From there to now, we have now, as I said, nearly 200 expressions in our warehouse. And in our portfolio right now, I would say we're close to somewhere between 30 to 40 expressions that are available quite easily around the world. So this particular series, the Brabazon, is a little bit more traditional. Now, what I mean by that is in terms of just its maturation, Irish whiskey, as we all know, is port bourbon or sherry. It's kind of your classic foundations for for Irish whiskey maturation. Uh, Alex Chasco, our master distiller, master blender, and I'll see if I can find, ah, nearly ruining the show. Uh, I'll see if I can find a photo of Alex, just for any of you who've never met him. I think he should be somewhere here. Uh, Where is Alex? Don't worry, we're not we're not going through all these slides painfully. Uh, that's Alex. Alex Chasco, our master distiller, master blender. He wanted to take the Brabazon series and take something that is traditional, but still bring a kind of a teeling twist to it, if that makes sense. So take an Irish whiskey kind of classic formula and bring it in a new direction. So this particular whiskey is aged in six. Or sorry, it's uh, the Brabazon 4. It's a 13-year-old single malt that has matured for uh, 11 years in uh, bourbon. So first fill American bourbon barrels and then two years in Carcavelos. Now, Carcavelos, it's a traditional uh, Portuguese fortified wine. Um, if any of you have never tried it, get your hands on a bottle. Honestly, you will not regret it. It is incredible, incredible fortified wine. Um, it kind of has a lot of similarities with Irish whiskey. So it used to be really popular around the 18th, 19th century. And then a lot of things affected the industry, like urbanization. So the change in Portugal of, of obviously civilization of lots of uh, industry and lots of housing, phylloxera. So obviously devastated the vineyards around the world. And then just general tastes. So but the point I'm making is Carcavelos is actually quite a rare fortified wine to use in, uh, in maturation for whiskey. It's not something that you'll find easy. And what I absolutely love about this whiskey is first the cooked fruits. So like the apple pie or apple crumble, uh, there's definitely a little bit of the pressed grapes um, or again, the citrus creeping through and then heaps of spice as well. Nutmeg, cinnamon, cloves, ginger, um, it is only two years in Carcavelos, but again, you're getting this really heavy uh, influence from the secondary maturation. You know, it's not a, it's a finish. It's not, a, I suppose, a full maturation. It's two years, but I think you really get it. And then the palate as well is so well structured. So if any of you do have the Brabazon series at home, the Brabazon 1 it was in sherry barrels, real sherry bomb, six different sherry casks, two styles, Pedro Jimenez and Oloroso. Brabazon 2 was port barrels. So this one here, you can see that beautiful color. Um, six different port pipes. Tawny port, ruby port, and white port. Probably one of my favorites of the series. As you can see, the bottle is never quite full at home. Uh, Brabazon 3 then again was one particular sherry producer. So it's this one here. That was a Jimenez Spinola. Um, so small scale bodega that actually specialized using Pedro Jimenez grapes for the last 300 years. Really high, high quality sherry producer. And then the last, the start to kind of end the series is the Carcavelas. Cheers, everybody. Slant it. Thank you. Gone in 30 seconds. <laughs> what is the percentage of the Barbazon for? Apology. Yeah, really good question. Sorry, who asked that? Was that yourself somewhere? No, no, it's fine. It's a 49.5% a ABV. So we're talking, sorry, was it, was it yourself, Shay, who asked that? It's, it's just below cast strength. Um, again, it's a good point to make because with this particular series, this was the first time that we had a large scale run that was, you know, higher a ABV. 
So we're looking at a particular, I suppose, demographic of people like yourselves who, you know, are obviously very into whiskey, but want whiskey in a bit more pure form and not as diluted. Um, our kind of standard, as I mentioned, is 46%. So we don't go below that. But the Brabazon sort of broke that mold. Um, you know, bearing in mind there was four series uh, and each were a little bit higher bottle runs. So this one was uh, 12,000 bottles in production. Um, and this now has just been released before Christmas. So you should hopefully still be able to find some stock, if, uh, if a little, in, uh, in Israel. The result is really good. I really like it. Oh, it's Anything amazing. in particular that you guys are tasting? Anything that I didn't mention? Lots of grapes, raisins, you know, dried fruits, uh, dark mm. fruits. Very typical to port, but it's similar but different, you know? Yeah, Great. I mean, it's a lot of similarities with white port. Again, you get those like nougat, white chocolate, um, those softer, creamy textures, but also a lot of the bitterness, a lot of the great. And I think that's what's so good about this whiskey for me is that balance between sweet and sour. Um, it's really not overwhelmed. That kind of acidity that you'll pick up in the spirit is something that you'll notice a lot more in our newer stock. So like in the, um, in the single pot still, for example, um, we are using wooden washbacks and also white wine yeast. So in wooden washbacks, I'm sure you all know this, it's building up a lot of very interesting esters. You know, you particularly get lactic acid, which combines with uh, ethanol producing ethyl lactase, one of the many esters that it produces during fermentation. And this gives you not only really heavy creamy notes, but also those kind of tropical fruits that you'll pick up from the fermentation. Uh, likewise, uh, with the white wine yeast, you know, that's driving through a lot of the acidity, but also flavors like passion fruit, guava, uh, even maybe mangoes in some circumstances. So when you when we try the uh, poutine, trust me, there is still a little bit of a fruitiness in there. It's not just all ethanol. It's not just all high ABV stuff. Lots of uh, tropical fruits, yeah. Yeah, like mangoes is one of those notes that I take up a lot from Teeling Whiskey. And again, we were talking about beers earlier like a lot of our whiskies pair very well with new england ipas new england ipas typically they'll use more contemporary hops which will give you flavors like banana and pineapple and mango so if i'm ever drinking like a beer and a whiskey together a teeling and a beer i'm going for for new england ipas kind of all day long they're also just super juicy which work really well with the whiskey so oh, that's the, the brabus on ford sorry go ahead that's a no, it's very interesting, you know, the combinations of uh, uh, beer with whiskey, you know. So um, uh, when you're saying tropical fruits and you're talking about Irish whiskey, then you immediately think of IPA. This mm. is probably something I'll probably do when we're done here. <laughs> Try oh, this nice. with IPA. Yeah, yeah. Well, if, if any day, fingers crossed, as I said, yeah. you do ever get a chance to come to Dublin or vice versa, if I get a chance in, in the near future to come to Israel, I will more yeah. than happily sit down and do a whiskey and beer pairing with you guys. That's amazing. And we could try a couple of different styles. Um, I won't bring any of the beers I make. Don't worry, I won't subject you to drinking crappy beers. <laughs> Only actual good producers. Um, you meant crafty, not crappy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry, that was the problem with the Zoom. It's, it, uh... <laughs> so as I said, I'm sure all of you are, are pr pretty familiar with Teeling Story. But just to give you, a, I suppose, a summary of from the 1980s to now, when we first set up our distillery, the first style of whiskey that Alex really wanted to produce was single pot still. So single pot still, do you all know what I'm talking about when I say pot still whiskey? Or is there anybody in the room that doesn't know what a single pot still is? Don't be embarrassed if you don't. It's absolutely fine. Explain, explain, please. Yeah, so single pot still is basically a category that consists of malted barley, but also unmalted barley. So unmalted barley from a flavor perspective typically adds lots of spices like cinnamon, nutmeg, cloves. Uh, do any of you drink rye whiskey out of interest? Yes. Do. Nice. Okay. Yeah. So rye whiskey has a lot of structural similarities with single pot still. Now the big difference with single pot still is in a lot of cases, it's triple distilled. So you have the spices, but also the fruits 
And then on top of that, it typically has a very oily mouthfeel. So this was the first style that we wanted to produce when we started distilling in 2015, in February 2015. So if you do the maths, you know, our first whiskey that we'll be trying later on, this is a four-year-old single pot still. And it's unapologetically a four-year-old single pot still. You know, we're not trying to pretend that it's something else. Um, but this particular category had not been made in Dublin for nearly 50 years. So from a historical point of view, obviously it makes sense. But from a flavor perspective, this is really where Alex was interested. Um, for any of you who don't know Alex Chasco, he's really, I suppose, the, the man behind it all. Uh, our master distiller, master blender. He was previously a master brewer before he became a master distiller. So he was working in craft breweries from the age of 16. Now you can see he's had the, the years of wisdom. Uh, he's, he's our master distiller now since the very start. But he was working with the Teeling family during the 1980s at Cooley. So if any of you are fans of the 21-year-olds, if you're a fan of the 24, the, the Brabazon, any of the, the, the old vintage stuff, you know, Alex did have a big hand in the days of Cooley. He was actually the head of innovation, was his title, at the Cooley Distillery in the 1980s. Uh, but he's really, you know, so sort of the head of the helm and everything we're producing. Um, with our actual production process, a third of our annual production is dedicated solely to experimenting. So every single time we look at kind of, a, I suppose, a, a new area, like as I said, when we started off, the maturation was the focus. Whereas right now, Alex is looking at a lot of different grain types. For example, we've already talked about a couple of different styles of beer, like stouts or IPAs or, or even, you know, New England IPAs. What he's doing is he's taking recipes that are used in the brewing industry, but that nobody is using in the whiskey industry. So to give you just one example, I'm sure you all know that dark beers have roasted barley. Uh, you know, it's barley that's been kilned to about 220, 250 degrees Celsius. Uh, if you were to malt that and distill it, you're creating obviously flavors that are entirely different than just your average you know, distiller's malt or unmalted barley, you're not getting typically, you know, dark chocolate or coffee, for example, from malted uh, barley. You know, probably the roasted malt, they use it maybe, maybe in the Glen Morangi. In the yes, the Signet. Yeah, you're right. So it's, it's one of the few brands around the world that does use malted, uh, or what's called chocolate malt. Uh, and this is one example of the many ingredients that Teeling are using at the moment. So the reason people historically don't use it in whiskey is because it's not very good for yield. You know, it doesn't produce a lot of ethanol. It doesn't produce much fermentable sugars. And um, outside of this, if we look at another category of beer, so if we look at strong ales or even barley wine, sometimes barley wine can have an ingredient. If you look at the, the back of your bottle there, Asaf, I don't know, maybe it'll be in your one. Uh, if you look out for something called caramalt or crystal malt, these are basically the same thing. It's barley that has been soaked in hot water, basically allowing the sugars to caramelize. Now, it's never used really in the whiskey process. Again, it's, it's, it's not great for yield, um, but this is something that we're experimenting with at the moment. So we're using crystal rye uh, as part of some of our new innovations. I think that they're, they cheated over here, I think. They use brown sugar. <laughs> oh, <laughs> they cheated. Brown sugar and a bit of treacle. Yeah. <laughs> So may, maybe, a, maybe a slightly different process. But um, yeah, I mean, it's a, good, it's a good analogy. If you think about it, normal barley is like granulated sugar. Crystal malt is like demerara or you know, rich brown sugar. It has a lot more of a thickness to it. But again, in terms of yield, it's not very effective. So everything that we do in the distillery is focused on quality rather than quantity. You know, we're looking at making the best whiskey that we possibly can, uh, I suppose, at the end of the day. And I think one great example of that on the, the next whiskey that we'll be trying, now this is, this is none of the new innovations. This is still the Cooley stock we're dealing with, but it is, I think, an absolutely stunning, stunning single malt uh, is our Renaissance Volume 2. Uh, and I'm glad to hear, um, sorry, I don't know who said that question, that they left the stout. I also have a little bit as well. I don't know if you can see in my camera. I literally have a drop left in my stout cask. And if you leave it there for a while, 
it gets stronger and stronger. And um, that's why actually I'm, I'm using two. I probably should have more glasses, to be honest. I'm just being lazy. Um, but if you do leave a little bit in your stout cast, it, uh, it only grows stronger. So I'm glad that whoever noticed that put that in the comments. Um, so then the next one that we're going to try is the, uh, the Renaissance Volume 2. Just going to make sure that my glass is actually clean. Would help. We're not going to do a pot still now. We're going, we'll do it later. Which would you prefer? Would you prefer to do the Renaissance or the pot still? So with the pot still, I think it would be a good idea to I think, try. I think, that, I think that the Renaissance would be um, a good, uh, you know, uh, finish. To, um, Finisher? Uh, sure. Finale. Okay. So, so just so you're all aware, we will be trying a piece of whiskey. So I know you all know this, but make sure to just have a bit of water before you go on to the Renaissance. Otherwise, you're going to be telling me it tastes like iodine. It tastes like peat. When we're trying to maybe we'll do too. maybe we'll do the pitted one late uh, the late uh, the, the last one maybe sure you know i don't think it's an issue because obviously you can just rinse out your palace but in that case if we if you want we can move on to the pot still it's actually probably a better example because it's something that we're making right now you know in, in 2021 so the the single pot still as i said this was the first style of whiskey that we wanted to produce in teeling and this as i think you really Kind of nicely put it asaf this is like the single malt of irish whiskey or it's like the champagne of irish whiskey and um, you can't actually make this category in any other country in the world so it's geographically protected and um, for example you couldn't recreate this style in israel it has to be bottled distilled matured fermented malted everything from start to finish it has to be made in ireland and um, so it really is kind of, I suppose, our point of difference when we talk about Irish whiskey and Scottish whiskey. To me, this is a bigger difference rather than triple distilled or double distilled, because we know there's examples of Irish whiskey that are double distilled. And we know there's examples of Scottish whiskeys that are triple distilled. So with this particular style, we decided to use 50 percent of uh, malted barley and 50 percent of unmalted barley. So half and half. Um, the whiskey itself is actually aged across three different cast varieties. So first and foremost, it is um, American bourbon barrels, virgin American oak, and Oloroso sherry casks. So we're talking 50% American bourbon, 25% virgin oak, and 25% Oloroso sherry. Again, bottled at 46% uh, ABD. And the age statement, we're talking around four years old. So have a smell of it, have a taste. If it's the first time you're trying a single pot still, I will be really excited to hear what you have to say about it. If not, you know exactly what you should be looking out for with a typical you know, single pot still whiskey. So what's really interesting about this particular whiskey, and I'm sure Danny, you might know, and perhaps some of the rest of you guys might, this original whiskey was actually done in a batch process. So we did three different releases before we, uh, I suppose, launched the finished product. The reason being is we wanted to test the recipe and experiment with different, different recipes, different mash builds, different cut points, uh, even different fermentation durations to really best kind of uh, I suppose, uh, replicate what we would think would be true to this style. But at the same time, trying to create, you know, again, a modern whiskey. So the final result, as I said, is the three different cast types. Again, this is using our white wine yeast, so South African white wine yeast. Uh, it's uh, a spontaneous or wild fermentation for 24 hours. And then triple distilled. Uh, again, our, our like our final, uh, I suppose, ABV when we're coming out of the third still will be about 80 to 84 percent. But for anything that's going into cask, we're diluting typically to around 60, 66 ABV. So with triple distilling, you're typically keeping a lot of those components from the yeast. You're keeping the esters. Uh, you're keeping those fruit notes. And for me, the big thing that comes through on the nose is either honeysuckle or, um, or again, those kind of cooked apples um, on the nose is a big flavor of our single pot. So if not, it again has a little bit of brown sugar, definitely a little bit of allspice. 
So not too dissimilar from the spicy point in the Brabazon, for example. And I know some people said it reminds them as well of pressed grapes or lychee on the nose. So again, that, that acidity is coming back from our washbacks, coming from the fermentation. So it's four years old, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So we're talking, it was, I'm trying to think, put in casks in... Da, 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 da. 2015 2016 it was bottled this final edition let me check the exact date september 2019 it feels young so, but it feels very balanced you know it feels uh, it's not too sweet it's not too um, uh, uh, it's very balanced very good yeah. mm -hmm. out of interest of many of you tried single pot so whiskeys before might be a, a stupid question but I'm assuming, you know, a couple of you have tried maybe Redbreast, mm -hmm. the 12, the 15, the Dream Cask. I'm sure you've tried some of the Middleton range or maybe the Spot range. Spot and the range, thing is, yeah. with this single pot still, I think we were very much not looking to replicate or create, you know, a carbon copy of these well-established single pot still whiskeys. Anybody that's talked to, you know, any of the team here or Alex or even Jack and Stephen, you'll know that was not their intention. They basically, you know, said they wanted to do something on their own and create something they thought would represent this category. That for, you know, the guts of many years was kind of represented by one particular portfolio, which was Irish distillers. Whereas now in Ireland, and I'm just going to share one image with you, which I hope will excite you as much as it does for me. If you look at the number of distilleries there are currently in Ireland, you will see how much this category is going to change. So there's now 38 fully functional distilleries in Ireland. Uh, in 2010, only 10 years ago, there was three or three and a half distilleries, depending on if you were counting Bush Mills, because obviously, you know, they weren't, uh, they weren't producing uh, a lot at the time. But four distilleries or three distilleries to 38 is absolutely incredible. And a lot of these new distilleries are looking at single pot still as a category. So you're starting to see a lot of change in this, you know, very prestigious style of whiskey that I hope, you know, in, in 10, 20 years will start to become very big around the world. It's already starting, but I think it will hopefully eventually have that same reputation as single malt, for example, in Scotland. You know, this is something regional to Ireland that we really should celebrate uh, around the world. But I agree with you, Asaf. I think it. I think it kind of punches above its weight. I don't like if I told you if I didn't tell you the age. I don't know if you be if you would say it's a four-year-old, for example. You know that our previous tasting was with the uh, also with Irish distillery. It was with the uh, relatively new one. Um, you know, uh, uh, Clonakilty. Oh, amazing! Yeah, yes. so I, I actually. Do you know something? I was only up recently at their distillery. I picked up. They have a great single cask in Bordeaux red wine. An amazing, amazing single cask. Um, yeah, I'm a big, big fan of their stuff. So they're a great example. You know, um, oh, his name, Paul, is, uh, is looking specifically a lot at single pot still. Their master distiller, master blender. He's focusing a lot on single pot still. Uh, did you try any of their beer collaborations, their barley um, wine? Yes, their... uh, um, uh, what was the name of the brewery? They were um, a Pelican, or, I, I don't know, something from the US, I think. Oh, yeah, the Pelican. Yes. It was yeah, amazing. All US, US best, best breweries. Yeah, really Pelican good. Brewery, yes, I think um, so. I think they also had a couple of beer styles. I can't I can't remember now. I, I tried them when I was at the distillery, but I They're also experimenting with beers, you know. Uh -huh. Yeah, no, they've some great stuff. They have a really, really good team there. And um, but that's you know, that's one example of probably I say at least 10 producers you could you could name that are looking at this particular style. So I'll be very excited when, you know, we can finally have a teeling 12 year old single pot still and a red breast 12. And we can then start to have these discussions um, as to, you know, um, where this category is going. But just to show you, and I know a couple of you have been before to give you, a, I suppose, a, a very quick tour of our distillery. This is uh, Teeling Whiskey in Dublin. So if you were to come to us, Guinness is literally uh, eight minutes down that way. If you go the far side, about 15 minutes in, I'm trying to think, this direction, 
uh, you will hit the Jameson uh, Visitor Center. And likewise, if you go again about 15 minutes another direction, you come to Temple Bar. Loads of restaurants, loads of bars, loads of nightclubs and stuff. So a really kind of vibrant area. Um, we're based in an area called the uh, Liberties. So it's a small area in Dublin, which originally was very kind of important for whiskey production. Um, I'm just going to bring you on over and show it to you now. Um, so this is the area where we're, ba where we're based in Dublin, called the Liberties. Um, so originally it was outside Dublin. Originally there was uh, 32 distilleries in this area just alone. So there's, you know, now 38 distilleries in Ireland. Imagine 32 distilleries in one city. Must have been absolutely crazy. Um, and some of the biggest brands in the world were, of course, based out of Dublin. So, you know, the likes of your Guinness, the likes of Jameson, the likes of George Rowe, Powers, DWD, the names really go on and on. And um, in our actual distillery, I'm just going to bring you on in. And unfortunately, the only thing that I can't bring to you through a screen is the smell at the moment. <laughs> but I can tell you it smells absolutely incredible. Uh, we're distilling predominantly single malt, as far as my memory recalls at the moment. Uh, so 100%, you know, Irish homegrown barley. Um, and at the moment, our annual production is still around 500, 600,000 LPA. So 500, 600,000 liters per year. Um, so this is the full distillery. You can see we, we do everything on site except for the malting. Now, the reason being is there's no farms in Dublin. So it's a little bit more tricky, I suppose, to get your hands on the raw materials. Um, our barley is coming from a company called the Malting Company of Ireland. So they're based down in the south, actually not too far from Middleton. And um, typically, you know, where we experiment a lot is the first and the middle stage. So the mill, as I said, experiment, experimenting on different grain types, from chocolate malt, peated malt, porter malt, uh, amber malt. We get to the fermentation, we're doing a wild fermentation using open wooden washbacks and white wine yeast. And then the stills, of course, were both double and triple distilling. So it really is dependent on the style of whiskey that we're looking to create, whether we double or triple the still. Like I'm sure you all know this, with each stage of distillation, you're reducing, I suppose, some of the characteristics of the barley, but you're highlighting the yeast components. So if we were to use, say, something like chocolate malt, and we wanted the flavors to come through really strong. In that situation, we might double the still versus triple distilling. But uh, this is the stuff here that you'll be trying now in a, a little bit later on, the, uh, the new make, or as we call it in Ireland, uh, putchine. So putchine, it's, uh, it's a Gaelic word. It actually means literally a small pot of something in Gaelic. Um, but it's essentially the same, you know, it's, it's new make spirit. Um, how do you feel about trying the 52.5? Do you want to try it now or do you want to wait a little bit later on? Uh, maybe we'll go at the end. So we won't kill ourselves. Go at the end? Before, uh, <laughs> whatever you want. Sure. But I think, so, I think, whatever guys want. Danny, what do you think? Now or later? I have another question. <laughs> <laughs> so what yeah, go ahead. About uh, the malt. Uh, do you produce your malt by yourself or you buy it already? No, we, as I said, we, we buy it already. Um, so a lot of our malt is coming from a company called the Malting Company of Ireland. And then for any of our specialty grains uh, or, or bort malt, um, sorry, I'm just seeing my internet connection is, is unstable. Um, I hope you caught that. So we're getting it from bort malt or the Malting Company of Ireland. And uh, any of our specialty grains, we're sourcing a lot of those from the UK at the moment. Uh, similar to producers um, that they would use for uh, a lot of craft breweries in the UK. So where do we go next? Where do we go next? So we've got Renaissance 2, we've got yeah. the Black Pit, and we've got the Spirit of Dublin is what let's we've left. The Black Which would you guys like to try next? The, let's maybe do the, the Renaissance now. Do the Renaissance, sure. Okay. So I'm just going to bring us back in front of the stills so that when we do come back... Number two, guys. Stuck. Stein, Hebre. Number two. Yeah. Asaf, when you say number two, what do you mean? 
Sample number two, Renaissance. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, we will we will wait for Asaf to return. It's <laughs> it's very confusing altogether, isn't it? Luckily, the Renaissance two is sample number two, and the Brabazon four is sample number four. Is that worth? What about well? everything, man? <laughs> <laughs> Well, as you can see, my sample, I may or may not have started already. So it's, it's, it's not exactly the fullest sample, but through a look. So the Renaissance is basically uh, replacing the revival series. So the same kind of idea, we're taking, you know, slightly higher age statements, looking specifically at wine casks for the most part. Um, uh, and, uh, and again, the same idea kind of celebrating the next chapter of teeling. So, you know, within the six years that we've been going as a distillery, obviously a lot has changed. We're now available in 70 international markets all around the world. Uh, we've picked up 300 international awards and we have obviously, most importantly, a lot more whiskey. So um, this is a, an 18 year old single malt that has uh, been matured for up to 17 years in bourbon. And then we're talking between 16 to 18 months in uh, Australian Shiraz wine casks. So New World wine coming from Australia. Um, typically Shiraz, it has this really full body, really tannic quality to it, but the nose is absolutely incredible. This is the first thing you'll see. So a bottle of 46% ABV. And as always, I'll let you guys lead first. Let me know what you guys are smelling or tasting. And then I'll take you through the whiskey a little bit more. It has a really nice body. I really like its body. Real rich. Yeah, it's, re it's really, really rich, really, um, there's a lot of depth to it. Um, you have a lot of citrus. Citrus, in my opinion, even meaty a little bit. Yeah. See, it's funny because for me personally, what I get a lot of at first is, well, A, the, the caramelization, so the, the toffee yeah, burnt, or even burnt, burnt, burnt sugar, caramel. Burnt sugar. Like the dried fruits or, yeah. Yeah, the burnt, the burnt sugar or then yes. the dried fruits. Horizons. But there is, like, isn't there? Uh, There's also a little wisps of citrus again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like orange in, uh, in a lot of uh, caramel sugar. Yeah, like like um, marmalade or Seville oranges yes. that are a little yeah. sweeter. Marmalade exactly. is really good. Me personally as well, what I get a lot of is uh, is red fruits. So like either cherries, I wouldn't say maraschino cherries, but um, again, slightly sweeter ones. Sweet, sweet uh, cherry. Yeah. I, or, um, I couldn't smell no cherries or no nothing, but it's just different and it's perfect the smell is perfect uh, mm. yeah it's it's not a it's not an aroma that we we get a lot is it like i know you know red wine casks are used around the world and obviously there's a big difference say for example for any of you who know our single grain which is american capsov casks versus say this which is australian shiraz um for me it's a little bit more punchy you know on the nose there is that kind of uh, woodiness or the the oak tannins that come yes, through a little bit yes, more. Yes, a lot of a lot of oak. Yeah, because a lot of people that say it's very alive on the nose. It's delicious. It's just, it's just different. It's very complicated. You know, it's yeah. higher level. It's, a, it's an interesting combination with the citrus, uh, cherry, and maybe brown sugar. Mm. Yeah. And, and yes, it's uh, it's quite. For the first time, it's quite a bit aggressive in the nose. If you let it uh, breeze, I think it comes much, much, much better. One yeah, hundred percent. It's a really good point, Gregory. And you can see I haven't even drank it yet. I'm still smelling it because I know that if you let it open up a little bit more, um, like even now, for me, I'm getting a lot more of those dried fruits, like figs or raisins, when it's opened up a little bit more. But again, you know, with this particular, with the, the American oak, really, because it's charred, it's soaked in a lot of that Kapsav, um, or not the Kapsav, God, the, the Shiraz. And so when you get down to the palate, 
it has such an explosion of those red fruits. Like on the nose, it's again, as you've all said, it's brown sugar, it's oak tannins, dried fruits, and a little bit of citrus, maybe some sugar in there or marmalade. When you get down to the palate, the red fruits are a lot more dominant. But uh, yeah, let me know what you think. Cheers. How do you say how do you say shumar in uh, in English? You know, anyone knows? You know, anise. I'm pretty sure Google knows. Yeah. In Morocco, they... a, la a light flavor of anise. Guys, try to add a few drops of water, like one drop or two drops of water. Change it, changes it for the best. That's Let's see better. what very, very bad. Much better. How do I say this? Just trying to Google what uh, what it is in English, but if anybody does know, let us know. No, I'm trying to Google Shumar and it finds me a guard. Penil. Yeah, Penil. Same, same here. <laughs> Shumar is fennel. 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 Yeah. fennel. Oh, wow. That's an interesting one. It's so funny, actually. We, we were only doing a tasting there the other day of our uh, birthday batch. So we have, as I said, celebrated our sixth anniversary there as a functioning distillery. I can't believe six years. It's gone by so quickly. Um, I just don't know where the time's gone. But uh, we released our, I suppose, our, our birthday batch as something to celebrate, you know, the new liquid, but also as a bit of fun. And one tasting note that... We were getting a lot of, uh, and it's so interesting that you mentioned with this, was fennel. Really? And we, we were saying like, oh, we didn't notice it as much in the other whiskeys. Um, but um, I personally don't get as much on the nose. I don't know if, if, if for you it's in the palate it's or more the on nose. The palate, yeah, it's more on the palate, less on the nose, yeah. Oh. On the palate. Of course, no, yeah. No. Especially if you add a little bit of water to it. You it get does. a yeah, very yes. fennel or yeah. dandelion. Yeah. Yeah, Hello. you're damn right. Uh, the water just opening and a lot oh, more. Space. Yeah. Stop, now that you say it. So this is what happens. The minute you say it, you can't deny it. That's all this you think about. Wow. This whiskey needs a lot of time, man. This whiskey is more complicated than uh, sitting with two minutes and drinking it, and it needs an evening, I think. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what size samples you gave people, but... Uh, yeah, 25 mils, sure, that's... <laughs> I'm, oh, that's, that's good. I'm, yeah. I was going to say, I'm sure if not, people will, will be coming back to you for more. Yeah. Um, so this particular one, obviously, this is the second edition. We have just released our third... I'll, I'll show you that even the, the packaging design and everything is beautiful. Like the bottle itself um, is a complete change from the Revival. Any of you know the Revival, and I'm, you saw it earlier... Yeah. Um, was a kind of more wider shape decanter. This one here, uh, you can see, is a little bit more slender. Beautiful design. Similar to the Revival, it has that, um, what you call it, the copper cap. Like the weight of that on its own is... Uh, like the Signet. The Signet have the same kind of, uh, uh, of a cork for metal. Yeah. It's very heavy. You could kill someone with this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm thinking about? Um, but it is, I mean, it, 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 it adds the overall prestige, I think, of the whiskey. You know, this is a, a definitely, you know, a high premium 18 year old single malt. You feel like you're getting something special with the packaging and the design. It kind of adds to it. And it's not something that, you know, we talk a lot about with Sealing, but I think the branding is obviously, you know, exceptional. I think they've a great team. Um, One of the beautiful bottles that I've ever seen, you know. You know, Chris, it's, it's, uh, um... When I first opened the, the Signet and I felt the cork, yeah, before I tasted it, this one, I could feel the yes, I could feel the the quality mm. of the packaging. It's a it's a beautiful bottle design, and it's a, it's it's probably one of my favorite of the whole range. Either that or the Nectar Door. I'm a sucker for Sauternes influences. There's not the, many of them around the world, but. Um, great, great whiskey. This is the first whiskey that I ever felt uh, notes of coffee, you know, with this. Oh, yeah, the, the Cygnus, yeah. yeah. It's funny, actually. Um, we only recently did a chocolate pairing there uh, with, with other brands. And what was on the tasting, the Glamorangi Cygnus, um, which was really interesting. You know, we had a, a sherry influence. I think we had our Bravas on three. 
which again, you know, sherry and chocolate, we know obviously pair very well together. But it was it was an interesting tasting um, kind of whiskey around the world. By the way, Chris, you made a really good job with the single barrel of the Whiskey Bar Museum in Israel. Oh, so yeah. It's old rum cask. Oh, I'm delighted to hear. Yeah, so we've had some good um, single casts, obviously, in the market very recently. And I think the rum influences have been very popular. Um, you know, there's some that you, you've tried, the ones, I think, Danny, that we've had at the distillery. Uh, we had, a, I think, a 23-year-old rum at one stage. But um, something I'd love to see replicated, you know, in the future. I think it would be, it would be great. No, I tasted the 15 years old in a sherry cask. But in my opinion, it wasn't a, a new sherry. It was a second fill or something. Okay. And it was so good. You know, some whiskey is a low for fair, first sight. This one was a low for second sight, but much deeper <laughs> Second fill. <laughs> so nice. good. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it'll be great now, obviously, to get people back into our distillery because we've, we've had a rotation of some of our single casks. Um, obviously, we do sell them to our online store. But you know yourself, there's something very special about trying uh, cast strength whiskey that you fill yourself at a distillery. Um, we're talking the example of Clonacilty. Like, I filled my own bottle when I was there, and it was, it was a stunning, stunning whiskey. Uh, it was Bordeaux red wine casks. But the third edition of the Renaissance, um, that is just out now at the moment in Muscat, the French Muscat wine casks. Um, similar to the revival, we will try to look to do, a, I suppose, a number of, of different whiskies in the series, potentially five. Um, and again, they have a great kind of collectability to them, similar to the revival. Um, I, I noticed that, for example, and apologies, I've forgotten your name, who had the... The 21 Hila, is this? Hila, Hila, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, who had the 21 and the revival. I, sh I saw your bottles were open like myself. So obviously yes. we're, we're drinkers. We're not, we're not collectors as much. <laughs> so as I said, just coming back to the distillery, um, our annual production, about 500,000 litres. The two stages that we don't do currently on site is the malting. As I mentioned, we outsource uh, our barley um, or, or our specialty grains like chocolate malt, crystal rye. Um, we are also testing out the likes of wheat and oats. So, you know, uh, there is kind of lots of other avenues that we could have talked about tonight. Uh, the maturation is the second area that's not done in teeling. So just to forewarn you, this is not the total number or the total number of barrels we have in Dublin. There's only about 20 barrels there. Uh, our warehouses are based in an area called uh, Green Ore, about 50 kilometers from Dublin. Uh, and up there, we have got thousands of casks. I think now we're up to about 30, 35,000 that have been distilled from Dublin, from this new site. Um, so a lot of new whiskey coming from here. Within the last Five years, I think now we're close to nearly 3 million litres of what we've distilled in that time. So the good news is if, if you're a fan of teeling, this and the Black Pits is only the start. You know, there's really a lot more to come that has been distilled from Dublin. It's kind of the next chapter of teeling. Uh, speaking of the next chapter of teeling, you'll notice the barrels here, and apologies, they're blocked a little bit by bars, sealed away, but you've got Holly and Zoe teeling. So our copper pot stills are named after the three daughters of uh, Jack Teeling. You can see uh, uh, Alison, Natalie, and Rebecca. So they're his three daughters. Uh, the casts themselves are named after Stephen's two daughters, uh, Holly and Zoe. So a nice kind of idea, you know, keeping it within the family. They will actually receive apparently barrels of whiskey when they turn 18. So Holly and Zoe, Zoe, that's their casks. You know, they, they own them. So fingers crossed they like whiskey when, uh, when they turn 18. Um, but that's just a, a demonstration of maturation. Now, with our maturation itself, I talked to you a little bit about the start. This is really the, one of the biggest areas where we look to experiment. So what, what nearly 200 the, different expressions. Tell me today, what is the capacity of tilling? How much uh, liters can you distill a year? 
Leaders annually, as I said, about between 500,000 to 600,000 yeah. would, would be our annual capacity. It's relatively small to a, a Scotch whiskey, but it's... <laughs> yeah, well, well, even some of the big producers in Ireland, you know, you, you're looking about at least four or five times less yeah. um, some of the bigger producers. Um, and again, you know, we're, we're focusing the whole time on looking at getting the highest grade casks when it comes to the maturation, as well as distilling. Um, with, say, for example, our small batch, you know, our flagship whiskey, we're only using about 55 to 75 casks for each time that we produce it. So it's, it's not massive quantities, um, but it'll probably be bigger than your typical like micro distillery, um, you know, producing, let's say, 200,000 LPA. Um, so with, with our wood variants, we're experimenting with different types of woods. I said acacia, chestnut, amberana, mizanara, you name it, our different season casks. We've everything from ginger beer, pineapple rum, aquavit, schnapps, vermouth. Uh, really, it's like Ikea but for whiskey drinkers. There's really kind of every single type of flavor you can imagine in the warehouse. Um, and, and typically, you know, our portfolio, the oldest age statement we have at the moment now is our 37 years old. So we're, the youngest we have is three. The oldest we have is 37. That's, that's aged, obviously. So I'm sure, speaking of the, the, the kind of the younger or the newer great stuff, I think it'll be a good opportunity to either try the Putchin or the Black Pits. Which, which are you leaning towards? Which would you prefer? Black Pits. Putin. The Black Pits will be the, the last one to finish with. Black Pits for the finish. Anybody else? I agree with us. I agree Fin with uh, Shai. Finish yeah, with the Black Pits. Yeah. Finish with Black Pits. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Now, the thing is, I know, I know we're all a little bit scared of the, of the Putin, of the spirit of Dublin, but trust me, it's a very, very flavorsome spirit. Um, it really is. There's a lot of character in this, and there's a lot of different ways that you can also use it, uh, which I can maybe chat to you about. Um, but the first thing, pour a little bit in your glass if you haven't done so already, and I'll talk you through what exactly it is. This is also a combination of uh, uh, malted and unmalted barley, yeah? And it also um, yeah, contains... correct. And it also contains... Uh, you also use them um, uh, uh, corn and... Uh, uh, other kinds of grains or only uh, uh, malted and unmalted barley? So, you know, we also use corn, as I said, also wheat and rye and oats, but this particular bottling yes. is just 50% malted barley and 50% unmalted barley. Cool. Yes, that's what I'm and asking. I poured yeah. myself way too much. <laughs> so we'll see how we get on. But, um, but yeah, so this particular one, 50% malted barley, 50% unmalted barley, this, as we were chatting at the very start, kind of has the same history or reputation as Iraq. You know, this was really, I suppose, the, the modern edition of Ishka Baha. Ishka Baha was one of the first spirits distilled in Ireland and Scotland. Um, but with this particular one, white wine yeast again, wooden washbacks, triple distilled uh, with this particular edition and bottled at 52.5% ABV. For me, the first this thing is that was really interesting this is not coming, it's, it's diluted a little bit, yeah? Yeah, so if this is diluted a little bit from the high 60s, you know, down as far as 52.5. And the well, very first thing, we've, we've kind of been talking about it a little bit tonight, is firstly the citrus, for me anyway, is the, the marmalade. It's very the, fruity. The pressed grapes, yeah, again, and as I mentioned from the fermentation, extremely fruity. What? What is poitine? What poitine means? So, what does poitine mean? It's, it's a good question. So it's, uh, as I said, it's a Gaelic word that in Ireland basically refers to the pot stills originally. Um, so it means a small pot of something. But essentially, it's a new make spirit. It's unaged whiskey is, uh, is what poitine is. Is it uh, the same new make probably that they use on the pot still? So this is the thing. Now, I don't want you to get confused that this is essentially put in barrels and that's tealing whiskey. This is one particular sample that we thought highlighted really well 
you know, one of our new make spirits. Um, the, the spirit is constantly changing. So, you know, you're taking cuts on a regular basis. Um, this would just be one representation of one of the many styles that's produced. But yeah, this is coming from the pot stills. Um, and then it's obviously not aged in any shape or form. Um, and it is still there on the regular still, right? Not on a coffee or something like that. No, yes. Yeah, yeah, it's a good point, Danny. It's, it's, it's pot still. So with pot still distillation, again, you're getting a lot more of the, the esters, the fatty acids, the oils, the texture. And you do see that with this particular whiskey. Me personally, actually, just to give you a couple of tips on, I suppose, how to drink it. I personally really enjoy putting with just a citrus peel. So like a, a lemon zest or an orange zest straight in the glass, drinking it that way. It again, mm. it complements the flavors already in this. If not, I treat it a little bit like mezcal. Now I know mezcal is a lot smokier. It's a completely different process. So it's probably not a great comparison. But what I mean by that is it has this earthiness that works quite well in either mezcal or tequila based cocktails. So say, for example, if you like a, a Paloma or if you like a, a Margarita or if you like, even if you want to go towards gin-based cocktails like a Negroni, this can also mm. work incredibly well as a substitute. So if you have, say, Cointreau, a bit of citrus, a bit of agave sugar, it can work really well to make a really great uh, uh, Irish whiskey cocktail. Um, so have any of you traced it yet? Let's see what it's like. And we'll, we'll walk through it a little bit more. What I would say, small sips, and if you want, you can always dilute further. I have to admit, I like it just the way it is, like, like mm. this. Me too. So no, I, I tried it as it is and added some water to it. And the water made it swath, swift in. And, oh no, uh, it ruined it, did soft. it? It is uh, soft and uh, a lot nicer if I, after I added uh, some water to it. Oh, that's good to hear, Manesh. Okay, so one thing I'm sure that you're noticing is if you add water, you're probably getting a lot more of the barley characteristics. So because mm -hmm. it hasn't had any interaction with the wood, there's a lot more of that cereal, the bread tones, uh, the toasted grain uh, that you'll pick up, particularly if you add a little bit of water. Me as well, I got a little bit of like anise at the finish. Um, I wouldn't quite go as far as saying cinnamon, but I think it does have that, um, again, that sort of autumnal spice to it. So this is the closest thing that you will smell uh, to the distillery itself, you know? Mm. When you go into the distillery itself, this is very close to what you'll smell there. As I said, I couldn't bring the distillery, the smell of the distillery, but I but stand this is corrected. Good. I yeah. stand corrected, I, I was. <laughs> I, I think that I smell some pears, maybe. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, something I was trying to pick up what that fruit flavor was earlier. And I think you've hit the nail on the head. It is. It's because um, definitely not. It's not for me anyway. It's not apples or other orchard fruits. But I think pears is a really good one. No, it's more pears than apples for me. Mm. Do you know something? I'm actually, you know, I am as like yourselves, always learning. I'm going to take a note of that because that is actually spot on. And this is the thing that I love about um, doing tastings with people. You know, you, you always get new notes that you can add. Very interesting. The palate as well, you notice it's quite buttery. You know, it, ha it is quite viscous. And the spice kind of sits on your tongue, I think is where it where it's kind of lingers. It's also slightly a drier finish. I don't know if you guys are getting that. Very malty at the end, the finish, very malty. Mm. Yeah, so obviously 50% malt and 50% unmalted barley. I must remember now, this is my water. This is my pochine. Don't <laughs> drink the pochine like water. I actually know just on a side note as well, someone that used this in uh, cooking. So if any of you guys do, or, or any of your ladies like to cook at home, um, it works really well. I think they did, if you, again, I can give you the name if you want to check her out. Um, she is a phenomenal, phenomenal chef. Uh, um, based in Holland, but originally from Ireland. Uh, the, just, sorry, trying to remember the recipe here. Um, 
which needs salmon. So it's it's this is not the exact recipe. I think it's a lot more elaborate than that. Uh, I think it's actually beetroot, beetroot salmon. But again, if you want to look for her recipe using the tea and put in, it's I've actually tried it at home and it's incredible. It works really, really well. Um, I don't know if many of you like to cook with spirits or even if you have ever cooked with beer, it's also a lot of fun. Um, if you haven't, I'd recommend trying it out next time you're making something. Yes, guys, drink a lot of water right now after drinking this. <laughs> This particular one as well, just one last thing on the whiskey. Again, I don't know if you can see my camera or not, but down the top or the right hand side here, it says 03. So this is actually the third batch we have done of this particular uh, new make. Um, so you might, if you come to Dublin, you might get a chance, say, for example, to try number four, if we have it. Uh, you, can, you can see if it's any different, how the spirit is kind of evolving. So that is the, the putching. Now, take your time. You don't need to rush into the last one. This is, this is the first batch. Oh, you're drinking the first batch. Oh my God, yeah. we have different, yeah. different <laughs> ones. So what I'm describing is, is maybe a little bit different to what you're tasting. Okay, um, that's interesting. I wonder, okay, so I must see if I can get my hands on the number one. I wonder what, what, will, we, what will we drink now? No, no, we're drinking right now the, the second batch. I also have the first one. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So the I'm I'm on number three. You're on number two. But that's also yeah. as number one. Yeah. <laughs> Just to complicate it even further. Yeah. But yeah, as I said, this is now becoming very popular in Dublin, and even around Ireland, you're starting to see a resurgence in putching. There's some fantastic producers. One in particular in Galway. Again, I'll just give you a name if you want to look out for them. Uh, these produce some Kraken uh, Puchin. There's loads that you can look out for um, that are very, very good. Just before we continue, does anybody have any questions? Shane, I notice you're writing a lot of notes. So if you do have any questions for me, please do do let me know. Not to not to single you out. It's great to see. You know that the last one that we're drinking right, uh, um, the black pits, is very interesting um, because we uh, our previous um, uh, tasting with the uh, milk and honey. Um, mm was actually um, uh, uh, for the Israeli um, uh, a choice. They, they gave us a few barrels to um, uh, uh, choose from, something like 50 guys or something like this. And we chose um, pitted um, uh, malt with the uh, uh, Sauternes finish, which is the same as this one. Yeah, that is very cool. Wow. Yeah, it's been, it's, so was, this was from Milk on Honey, was it? Yes, yes. It, uh... It's been a while, actually, since I've tried a lot of this. So I, I suppose one of the, the downsides of uh, not being able to travel, well, one of the many not being able to travel at the moment is normally, you know, whiskey festivals or, at, uh, or even uh, sales drives, you have an opportunity to try all of these whiskeys, you know, together with people. And as a result, I found I haven't tried as much world whiskey, uh, unless I'm ordering it, you know, online or whatever. Um, but yeah, they've some they've some amazing stuff. So this particular one, the Black Pits, and again, for any of you peat heads, I will be interested to hear your thoughts. The first thing I have to say is that this is not, I suppose, a reiteration of uh, an Isla peated single malt, of like a Frolin, uh, geez, my brain, a Froig, like a Vullen, uh, a Coleman, you know, whoever we're talking about, it's very much a Irish peated single malt, more specifically a teeling peated single malt. So this is the, the bottle here. Um, you're dead right, it's matured in Sauterne and Bourbon. So it's a combination of two different casks. Um, it's also lightly peated. So the PPM, I'm sure you all know what I'm talking about, it is 15.15 PPM. So with the light piece, you know, the aim of this whiskey was to not have it being the dominant factor 
but really just a component of the whiskey that brought everything together, if that makes sense. Um, and again, with this particular whiskey, we did want to use triple distillation in this situation to bring down the phenols and to raise the esters. The result is something completely unconventional, something completely different. So pour yourself a little bit of a sample and, uh, and let me know what you think. It's really nice. It's really balanced. You know, Super well balanced, yeah. In this occasion, the pit and balance. It lightly sour, concentrated, smoky. It's funny, yeah. So I've noticed like nobody's saying iodine, like there's no iodine in this. And the reason being is, so you know the way typically with a lot of, um, say, peated Scottish whiskies, you'll get that in the distance. Yes. Yeah, this doesn't have that. Now, the reason being is it's where we source the peat from. So it's coming from Glenesk in Speyside. And this particular um, piece of malt has a lot more of those kind of barbecue sort of smoke flavors rather than medicinal or iodine. So that's the first thing that for me makes it very interesting. You know, you've got charred fruits. Like if you think of like charred pineapples on the nose. Um, again, you've got a little bit of a saltiness coming through. And then the sauterne is adding those really nice red fruits, um, but also general um, dried fruits like apricots or nectarines and salted caramel this on the amazing, nose. amazing, man. Chris, is there a pit uh, on Ireland somewhere? There's a, yeah, it's, it's a good question that you ask actually, Danny. I think now nearly two thirds of the country is covered in peat. Um, we are not using Irish peat at the moment and it's down to a logistics thing. It's, it's, it's difficult to use peated malt coming from Ireland. Um, don't ask me why, there's a, a kind of a long backstory as to why Irish peated malt is not possible. But I suppose similar to some of the other ingredients, you know, like corn, for example, it typically comes from countries like France or Spain. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's not an Irish whiskey because the peat is not coming from Ireland. No, no, um, I just wanted to know if there is a, any peat source in Ireland. I think that there might be a possibility. So the thing is, as far as I recall, it's still geographically, uh, it's going to be geographically protected. Um, I think for environmental issues, it's not as, as possible to use it. There's, there's some issue that I, I actually can't remember. Um, but essentially, there's, there's not a lot of malting companies that are willing to peat their barley. Um, you know, like the Malton Company of Ireland or, uh, or other large scale producers. I think it's something that possibly might change if there's a lot of demand for peated Irish whiskey. And um, I can tell you right now, you know, there's nearly 18 different producers that are looking at peated expression. So, you know, for example, again, we talked a lot about Putchin tonight. I'll just give you one other example. Uh, this crowd here. Uh, Cologne, they have some great peated putchin. Um, there's also producers that are making peated gin, peated vodka, and of course, peated whiskey. So this is something that's slowly but surely changing in Ireland. You know, Irish whiskey was peated back in history. Uh, there's references, particularly in the north of Ireland, of examples of big, um, you know, producers of peated whiskey. So it's not like it never existed. And this is, again, if you think about it, this is the second whiskey the Teeling ever produced. I think it really says a lot about the company. If the first whiskey we make is pot still and the second is peated, um, you're definitely going to see more peated whiskey from Teeling in the future. People are asking about the black glass that you're drinking from. Mm. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, we can actually, so yeah, this is our, we, we had a, I suppose a, a collaboration there with Glen Carn. I think as far as I'm aware, they still sell them on our distillery store. If you want to, uh, if you want to check it out, if not, you can feel free to to send me an email or whatever. I'm sure I can. I'm sure I can do my best to to sort you out. Um, Another question: If we're talking about glasses, um, do you also have the uh, the tour glasses as well? Teeling, no, not yet. So, uh, me personally, yeah, I have a lot of tour glasses at home, but yeah. Teeling doesn't have one. Yeah, really? they're nice. And the thing that I like about the tour glasses, you can put them on their side. Yes. And they don't they don't fall left or right. Um, they're they're yeah. So they're for anyone who doesn't know, they're an Irish producer, kind of the equivalent, I suppose, of Glencairn. Uh, they do some really really nice glassware. 
Um, and again, I know I've been typing a lot, so feel free to ignore me if you like, but that's just the name if you do want to look them up. Um, obviously, in, Ir in Irish, it's pronounced in a completely different way. That's Tua is, is how you say it in, in, in Irish. You do send to Israel. Uh, you, you do have a shipment to Israel that we can uh, order from your website, or uh, you think? Yeah, we do. Yeah, so we've we've uh, sent to Israel in the past. Uh, should be. I'm glad to hear. Yeah, I, do you know something? I didn't even realize that I was drinking from it. I just grabbed the glass uh, from the from the bar there. Uh, they're nice, though, aren't they? Uh, the yeah. black blend current. The only issue is you can't see what you're pouring in it. So like yeah, for blind tasting, a, it's good. You, you could have a 50 mil sample and you'd never know. But good for <laughs> blind tastings. Um, About the black pits, which kind of cask and for how long? So, there, so it's two thirds of bourbon and one third of Sautern. So Sautern, of course, regional dessert wine from the south of France. Typically with Sautern, what's interesting in their production is they, they allow bacteria or what's called botrytis to build up on the grapes, which essentially uh, creates, I suppose, more of a high sweetened uh, wine at the end of the process. Again, it's quite low yield. But if you can imagine the typical flavors it's adding are those heavy sugars, dried fruits like apricots, nectarines, maybe red fruits so like sultanas or pressed grapes. And sometimes you might get the likes of either white chocolate or even like honey or caramel. Beautiful, like it's uh, so it's, uh, from Bordeaux, in the south of France. Uh, if you ever get a chance to go on holidays, go to Bordeaux. It's a beautiful, beautiful area of France, uh, and buy a bottle of Sauterne. Trust me, you'll you you won't regret it. Probably one of my favorite wines in the world, actually. Sauterne is wonderful wine. Mm. It really is. Yeah. So it's typically drank as a dessert style wine. So what I like about this again is that you're, you've got the sweetness of the Sauterne and the heaviness of the piece kind of balancing out each other. Yeah. Like one thing we talked about Glenmorangie, one thing Glenmorangie for me doesn't have in obviously the Nectar d'Or is the peat influence. And if you remember, I mentioned much, much earlier, the 21 year old, the 21 was the first iteration from Teeling that had peat and Sauterne. And that's where this idea came from. So this is not a whiskey that started one day when suddenly Alex was like, oh, let's use Sauterne. This came from years of testing and practice and success and failures. And the final result now is uh, the Black Pits. The difference between Black Pits and the 21 is the 21 is only a small percentage of piece. So I think around 5%. The Black Pits is 100% peat of malt. And that 21-year-old eventually went on to become the Teeling 24-year-old which won the world's best single malt at the World Whiskey Awards in 2019. And then that became the 28-year-old, which won the best Irish single malt at the World Whiskey Awards just this year. So a really a, a wonderful collection of single malts, the 21, 24, 28. Um, they really, really are. Particularly for any peat, peat advance. So thoughts on the black fish, black pits. Was it yourself, Manesh, that was saying that you were a big Peter whiskey fan? Everybody likes Peter, I think, most of the people. But yeah. uh, that one is very, in one side, very light Peter, and in the other side, the Sutern is very uh, influencing. So massively, yeah. The, the sweetness together with the Peter is very nice together. Mm. Yeah, I think it's also, you know, again, I don't know if I mentioned it, but this is, a, you know, around four years old and you'd never think it. It's really punching, I think, massively above its weight. It's just uh, much older. I mm. think it's, it's very sweet, very balanced. Uh, and yeah, it's light pitted, actually. Yeah, yeah so again, with, with the, the piece when we started, it was 55 ppm before the distillation. But at the very end, you know, the final spirit, we were talking 15. So a lot of no, places no. when they talk about ppm, you know, they don't necessarily talk about the final spirit. They talk about the barley, how heavily it's been peated. And I can tell you this much. In my opinion, only Elsa Bay declared the actual uh, ppm after the distillery. Which, which distillery? Elsa Bay. Yeah, 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 okay, okay. Oh, okay. 
most of the distillers don't mention it. No, no, and I, I actually didn't know that example. Yeah, I, I assume that the majority typically don't mention in the final spirit. You know, they'll say 54 ppm, but then really in the final spirit, it's 20. Even at the Octamore, they mention the ppm before the distilling. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's 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 interesting, isn't it? But um, but I think it's still significant. You know, if you're if you're levels of phenols are really high uh, at the start of the process you know it's it's an interesting sign of what the final spirit is going to be yeah, um, and with this particular one it went in a completely different direction like we experimented with double distilling this the reason that we wanted to go with triple distillation for this particular product is jack teeling actually specifically wanted to take an irish tradition and i suppose a, a typical you know world uh, tradition particularly scotland and sort of bringing them together in the middle uh, was the idea. But we have also tested other cast types with this, so like the likes of cognac, the likes of sherry. We have been looking at cast strength versions, which I think would be amazing. Um, next, uh, next tasting, we'll do cask strength things. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure at all with the with this recording and all. Yeah. Um, so, um, but yeah, I think it's I think it's very exciting times. I personally would love to see a lot more peated whiskey from Teeling. Because on a side note, when I first started drinking whiskey, uh, many, many years ago now at this stage, I started with peated whiskey before anything else, weirdly enough. So I drank like shitty, you know, bourbons. I drank like Jack Daniels, Maker, Maker's Mark. I drank like wild turkey, maybe some other stuff. And I drank peated whiskeys was, was how I started. And then I kind of got into, you know, Irish whiskey. I kind of transitioned from peated stuff to space eyes to Ireland's and uh, haven't, haven't looked back since. I'm just realizing that my camera has literally just gone. So it's probably a good Ooh. chance to say, um, thank you so much everyone for your time. It was an absolute pleasure to chat to you this evening about Teeling. If you do have any other questions, and I'm just realizing my screen is also frozen, yeah. which is ideal. <laughs> But um, thank you so much for your time. It was lovely to meet you all. And I hope, honestly, that we can either meet in Israel or here in Dublin, you know, in the near future. Um, if you do have any other final questions, honestly, I'm more than happy to stick around. But uh, to finish up for myself, I just want to say again, thank you so much. Do you intend on using um, uh, uh, higher um, uh, PPM uh, um, whiskey at the, the, in the near future? Yeah, it's something that we've, we, again, we've talked about, you know, you will retain a higher, this is so weird, just with a black screen, so I apologize. Um, but yeah, we, we have, for example, looked at double distilling, which will retain the phenols, meaning that you get a higher PPM in the end spirit. So it is a possibility, you know, I think the thing with teeling is nothing is impossible or nothing is, is, is out of the question. Um, it's just, I think, depending on when's the right time or if, if it's really, you know, the direction that we want to go in. But I think that, you know, the way it stands at the moment, the Black Pits has been very successful and we're very proud of it. And I think it'll definitely encourage, you know, more repeated expressions in the future. Cool. Any other questions, guys? Question, but Chris, I had a very good time. Oh, thank you, Tomer. So nice of you to say. I hope that we can we can meet in person anyway. And as I said, I will happily do a beer and whiskey pairing with you guys, or just another straight up calf strength tasting would be also quite cool. Thank you very much. But uh, no, thank you. Cheers, guys. What I will say is in, enjoy the rest of your evening. Chris, up to see you, you in Whiskey Life as well. Yes, 100%. I would love to see you all at Whiskey Live. Chat to you all soon. Enjoy the rest yeah. of your evening. Make sure to have water after that thank poutine. You. Thank poutine. you very much, Chris. man. Bye. Chris, thank, thank you very much. It was a pleasure to meet you and to get to know all the whiskeys that you, that you showed to us. Likewise, thank Gregory. Thank you. Bye, man. Thank you very much. See you guys. Goodbye.